Come on in. Thank you. My name is Virginia Gross. Welcome to the West Heights United Methodist Church. Grab a seat, grab some coffee or something else to drink. Make yourself comfortable and let's enjoy worshiping God together. What a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still. And with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Then in fellowship sweet, we will sit at his feet, or we'll walk by his side in the way. That he does, we will do, where he sends, we will go. Never fear, only trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. This morning, our Psalter comes from the 62nd Psalm, and we will sing a response along with that. You are invited to join in, as well as with the responsive verses. I sing your praise for steadfast love, fulfill your purpose for me. For God alone my soul waits in silence. For my hope is from God, who alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress, I shall not be shaken. On God rests my deliverance and my honor. My mighty rock, my refuge is God. Trust in God at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before God, who is a refuge for us. I sing your praise for steadfast love. Fulfill your purpose for me. Those of low estate are but a breath. Those of high estate are a delusion. In the balances, they go up. They are together lighter than a breath. Put, Put no, no confidence, confidence in extortion. extortion. Set, Set no vain hopes on robbery. robbery. If, if riches, riches increase, Set not your heart on them. Once God has spoken, twice I have heard this. Power belongs to God. And to you, O Lord, belongs steadfast love, for you repay all according to their work. I sing your praise for steadfast love, fulfill your purpose for me. the Lord. 
by step and day by day, Jesus, the light of the world. Walk in the light, beautiful light, come where his love and his mercy are bright. Shine all around us by day and by night, Jesus, the light of the world. Good morning. Do you like it when somebody invites you to play ball? How about these big balls? Do you have one of these? Have you played with one of these? You can dribble it. But what I like best about it is that I can sit on it and bounce. What makes you want to follow somebody or join somebody or play with somebody? For me, it's the possibility of having fun. I like it when somebody invites me to play and to do something active and fun. Jesus invites us to follow him, and Jesus calls out to his friends, follow me. What makes you want to take the risk of following someone, or maybe the risk of leading somebody or inviting somebody to play? Will you pray with me? Dear God, thank you so much that you invite us to follow Jesus and that you invite us to bring people in to join. Thank you for all the ways you bring fun to our lives and all of the ways you invite us to catch. Catch! Our Old Testament reading is from the third chapter of Jonah. The Lord's word came to Jonah a second time. Get up and go to Nineveh, that great city, and declare against it a proclamation that I am commanding you. And Jonah got up and went to Nineveh according to the Lord's word. Now Nineveh was indeed an enormous city a three days walk across. Jonah started into the city walking one day and he cried out, just 40 days more and Nineveh will be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast and put on mourning clothes from the greatest of them to the least significant. God saw what they were doing that they had ceased their evil behavior. So God stopped planning to destroy them, and he didn't do it.
Hear these words from the Gospel of Mark, 114 through 20. After John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, announcing God's good news, saying, Now is the time. Here comes God's kingdom. Change your hearts and lives and trust this good news. As Jesus passed along the Galilee Sea, he saw two brothers, Simon and Andrew, throwing fishing nets into the sea, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, he said, and I'll show you how to fish for people. Right away, they left their nets and followed him. After going a little farther, he saw James and John, Zebedee's sons, in their boat repairing the fishing nets. At that very moment, he called them. They followed him, leaving their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired workers. to the reading, understanding, and doing of the scripture. Let us pray. Come Holy Spirit and inspire our hearts. If you are with us, then nothing else matters. And if you are not with us, then nothing else matters. May the words of my lips and the meditations of our hearts be wholly pleasing and acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. In today's Old Testament reading, we have a portion of the story of the extraordinary prophet Jonah. By definition, the word prophet means a mouthpiece or a spokesperson. A prophet's vocation is to listen to God and say what God says to say when and how God says to say it. But you may remember or recall how that story goes. Jonah initially refuses to go to Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, the heart center of the enemy of the Israelites. The Assyrians were the despised ones, the evil ones. And Jonah did just about everything he could to not go there. He fled by land, he fled by sea, he fled under the sea, but God pursued Jonah to all the places he fled. Our passage today picks up after the great fish spits Jonah up on shore, and he finally realizes that he cannot escape God. And God says, get up, 
and go to Nineveh, that great city, and declare against it the proclamation that I am commanding you. And you could almost hear God saying, and I'm not telling you again. Finally, the reluctant prophet heads to Nineveh. It's a big city. It takes three days to walk across it. And then through probably the shortest sermon ever preached, just 40 days more and Nineveh will be overthrown. The people believed God. And God witnessed the changing of hearts of the Ninevites so overwhelmingly that God had a heart change as well and decided to spare them instead of destroying them, which made Jonah really mad. Fast forward to Mark's gospel lesson where we encounter John the baptizer yet again, by now, he's done telling people someone greater than he is coming. By now, the resistance to his message of the coming kingdom results in his incarceration. Jesus picks up where John left off, saying, Now is the time. Here comes God's kingdom. Change your hearts and lives. Repent. Repent and trust this good news. For Mark, the good news of God includes the good news about Jesus, but this good news comes with a risk. Attentive listeners should note that the word Mark uses to describe John's handing over or arrest is the same word that later is used to describe the betrayal of Jesus. But for now, Jesus is on the move. He is making his way along the Sea of Galilee and sees two brothers fishing. Not your typical weekend, let's go and throw a few lines kind of fishing. These guys are at work. And Jesus says, come follow me and I'll show you how to fish for people. And just like that, they drop their nets and follow him. And then Mark tells us that Jesus walked a little further and saw two other brothers sitting in their boat, mending their nets, and he called them, and they left their father and followed him. Don't you find that remarkable? Fishing was their profession. Who knew how many generations before them had fished that sea? These two sets of brothers were actively engaged in their work. They were fishing for their lives, to feed their families, and, and to provide for their families by what they would barter for the fish they'd caught in the marketplace. And yet, at Jesus' invitation, they went with him, not having any idea what was in store for them. I wonder what went through their minds when Jesus tells them that he will teach them to fish for people. How was that anywhere near persuasive enough to get them to leave their nets? For James and John to leave their father Zebedee behind as well. For Mark, Jesus' first demonstration of his authority is making these calls on their lives. This speaks to us about the compelling nature of Jesus' call on our own lives. There is an urgency and an importance that requires immediate action. And Mark is telling us telling us that in order to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, in order to follow Jesus, some may have to leave behind more than others. 
Jesus invites these fishermen to cast their nets further than the harvest of the sea, to reach out beyond the limitations of the shoreline and connect with people, building relationships with them. He is inviting them to harvest hearts and souls for God's kingdom that has come. It is an invitation to experience life at a whole new level. It was an experience to come fully alive. Our English word vocation comes from the Latin vocatio, which means calling. What is each one of us called to do? What brings us fully alive in the world? Religious and civil rights leader Howard Thurman says this about vocation. Don't ask yourself what the world needs. Ask yourself what makes you come alive and then go do that. Because what the world needs is people who have come alive. When God calls us, it is a spiritual matter. If we let our emotions rule the day like Jonah's hatred of the Assyrians, then we're bound to run from God in, in all manner of directions. When we trust and obey God's call, we're likely to hear how our skills and talents are metaphors to engage others. How will we respond? Will we be reluctant in our answer or will be re Will we be resolved to risk it all? Are we willing to turn from the limitations we think hold us back to live lives in which we cast our nets for greater purpose? I was an accountant when my call came. I like to say I went from counting beans to counting sheep. Jesus sees us where we are, doing what we do. Nothing spectacular, nothing really out of the ordinary. We're just doing our work, going to school, earning a paycheck, volunteering our time, whatever it is. And then he calls to us. Few of us get the blinding experience that Paul got on the Damascus Road, and we should be thankful to God for that, by the way. What these stories of Jonah and Simon and Andrew and James and John tell us is that God calls to us in a myriad of ways and that our responses are just as varied. While the Assyrians needed to repent or turn from their evil ways, Jesus' invitation to the fishermen to repent had a whole different connotation. Turn from what you are doing or the way you are doing it and live into my kingdom, he says. God's call necessarily causes us to ask these questions. What am I called to do with this? How can I live out this divine encounter in some meaningful way that will enrich the world? When Jesus calls us, he puts us to work for God's kingdom, one that is built on love. And love is needed in every sector of our society. Every profession needs this confession of God's love. Amen? The world needs more people who have been brought fully alive. And the thrust of that is that if God has given us a calling, what God invites us to, that will bring us most fully alive. And if we trust and follow that, if we trust and obey that calling, we will be doing the good that God desires for us to do in this world, in whatever capacity that might be. Like Jonah and those early disciples, we never know what is in store for us when we respond. But the psalmist reminds us that power and love reside in God, and that we can count on. 
Few of us are asked to actually change our vocation, but all of us are invited to rethink our vocation in ways that can empower love to others and empower others through love. Still, it's risky business, often running countercultural to the whispers of the world. What we are called to do is to cast a wide net, perhaps around those who we would consider not worthy. But you can bet that those are the ones that Jesus is most interested in connecting with. Jesus calls us and we are invited to be risk takers in and for God's kingdom. It's no news to anyone that we live in a divided age. We can't seem to come together to agree on anything. Before Jesus was handed over, he prayed for unity, my friends. He prayed that we would be one as he and the Father are one. As disciples of Jesus Christ, we are invited to cast a net wide for unity. What is Jesus inviting you to fish for today? Is it love, peace, hope, justice, reconciliation? Some of us are called to heal nations and others of us are called to heal our neighborhoods. Through God's call and our faithful response, God will heal us all. Let us resolve to risk and see how the good news of God's kingdom will transform the world around us. Although sung to a familiar tune, these words written by Carolyn Winfrey Gillette are for such a time as this. Let us lift our voices as our singers lead us. In God of love, we've known division to the tune of Come and Find the Quiet Center. God of love, we've known division and we've seen its awful cost. We have struggled as a nation, and there's much that we have lost. We have been us divided, and divided we can't stand. May our nation be united, give us peace throughout this land. Turn us, Lord, from what divides us, fear that drives us far apart. Greed that leads to great injustice, racist ways that break your heart. May we seek what brings together hearts that bear each other's pain. Care and mercy toward our neighbors, love that welcomes strangers in. May we all in conversation Speak the truth and listen well. May we hear across this nation stories others have to tell. May we learn from other cultures and be blessed by their worldview. May we serve with one Loving others, loving you. You have challenged 
us to goodness. You have shown a kinder way. It's your love that now inspires us as we seek a better day. May we end our hearts division. May we stop the hate and fear. Make us one, Lord, as a nation. May we be united here. My prayer today is an adaptation of John Vandelaar's poem, Another Way. Let us pray. Teach us the courage, O oh God. Give us the resolve to turn from what seems so natural, so safe, the way of grasping power and befriending the powerful in the hope of protection and security. Teach us the humility, O oh God, to turn from what is so enticing, so persuasive, the way of accumulating things and trusting in wealth and the, in the hope of comfort in life. Lead us, O oh God, in another way, the way of true security, true wealth, the way of Christ, the servant, the way of weakness and simplicity. Lead us, O oh God, in another way, the way of caring for the neglected, feeding the hungry, housing the homeless, protecting the threatened, and challenging the powerful. It's the foolish way of the gospel that brings the good news of salvation to all. Heal our hearts, heal our nation, heal our world as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. When we bring our offerings, we bring all, our all of our emotions and we bring our whole selves to God. We bring our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and witness. I invite you to pay close attention to the words of the next song, which sum up 
this offering that we bring and this service of listening for call. Will you come and follow me if I but call your name? Will you go where you don't know and never be the same? We offer our gift. God wants to answer prayer in you, to pray in you, to be found in the you you hide, to go with you and before you, to surround you. May you go in this confidence. May you go in peace. Amen. <laughs>